Nancy, uh, as she was uh, declining at the very end, uh, said to me, I never cleaned out the attic. I said, don't worry about it, I'll clean it out. And she said, uh, give the stuff to anybody who wants it and just throw out the rest. She was, I think, quite unsentimental about the work. The important thing for her was producing it. I think she would be very surprised that we mounted a show. the best of my knowledge, she never had a one-person show. I mean, she would go to the crafts fair, and, you know, at the crafts fair, those are 10 by 10 booths. So you show what you can show in a 10 by 10 booth, but I don't think she ever had it, a, a huge exhibit like that of her stuff. So it was really interesting to see all the work hung in, in, in one place, and you could sort of see the various stages of the career. And Frankly, it was sort of overwhelmingly colorful because a lot of the stuff she did was, was colorful and, and to see it all in one place was great. I, I think that was one of Bob's motivations uh, in thinking about the show in Portsmouth is that he could see the potential for it and he had a better sight. We talked about the uh, rediscovered work, um, and that was actually my notion. And it, it's a, frankly, it's an antiques roadshow notion. You know that that people find things in their attic and and haven't thought about it or or realized that it has any value. And that was my sense when we were hauling all this stuff out of there, which is, you know, I didn't know it was up there. I don't think Nancy realized how much was up there, and. So it really is a rediscovered uh, Master Weaver's work. To me, that was one of the interesting things, is that it had been up there for so long. The weaving stuff in both storage areas was more tucked in back. So until I think Doug got up in there, it didn't realize the mass of that. So he'd uncover a few, we'd dig out more. A few days later, more would come out. Nancy rolled up the weavings in these big brown paper rolls. And what I thought was just a bunch of empty rolls up in the top of the garage were actually, they all contained uh, hangings. The weavings in many cases were wrapped with names on them. So we had quite a bit of information on the wrappings. Um, it's now history. We don't know why they were there, but we probably came up with 60 major weavings probably over a hundred smaller ones, boxes of clothes, thousands of labels, uh, and probably thousands of samples of just things that she had tried, maybe liked, maybe was going to get to someday, or maybe just uh, said, I don't think this is gonna work, and they just filled boxes and boxes and boxes. I think everyone was surprised at the quantity of material. Um, I think when Doug and Nancy moved uh, to New London, uh, much of this um, material was in stock and was just put up in the attic as she began to move from weaving to the hand-painted fabrics. And I suspect even Nancy didn't know what the quantity of material was that had gotten up attic. Um, and it was a surprise, I know, to Doug and to Bob, um, the amount of stuff that kept coming out and that Doug kept finding even after Bob had taken what he thought was a representative sample. So, yeah, it was, it was an awful lot of stuff. I thought there's got to be some reason to keep a selection of these items for a period of time for either shows or a gift to a museum or just to see who's interested in this. So I went through and tried to pick a sampling of the best items that had come out of the storage area in all different categories, be it clothing, major hangings, smaller hangings, uh, samples, uh, paperwork, design items, uh, and, oh, hundreds of slides, thousands of slides. I don't know whether it was 
Bob Chase or myself who realized that when he inherited so many of these weavings, that they'd make a perfect uh, exhibit for the Academy Galleries. So I suggested that with so many weavings that we could put them up uh, for the winter. Um, what I hadn't um, immediately recognized were the amount of design materials he had also inherited from Nancy. And I became quite intrigued with that material, um, both um, weaving designs on paper, um, the yarn wrappings that would show the actual yarns to be used in a particular um, title, um, as well as um, a whole, uh, it must be volumes, probably hundreds and hundreds of slides uh, of other works that she had done from the 70s on. Um, there's a, she began with cotton weavings and branched out into the mohair and later the, um, the metallic thread weavings. And as you go through the slides, I realize you can begin to put some dates on which titles, which subjects, which uh, themes um, she was following at any particular part of her professional career. And that intrigued me. And then I decided we should actually show some of these because they're attractive in and of themselves, but it really helps people understand that these large, large weavings of New Hampshire landscapes don't just pop into existence by themselves. Well, my interest was to get um, some interpretive material, uh, a brief biographical sketch, a, uh, um, some statements from Nancy about what she was trying to do to make this a first-person exhibit about how she approached both the thematic subject of New Hampshire landscapes and the idea of weaving and the use of textures and design to create these landscapes. Um, so I went through all of the professional portfolios, the cut sheets from magazines, all her published stuff, um, a couple of different um, CVs that she had in her portfolio to try to get a sense of what this career was like and what she was saying about her work. Um, so that ended up in the large format um, interpretive panels uh, throughout the exhibit. Uh, and then, as I said before, the design materials, uh, working with the slides, working with the actual objects, working with the yarn windings to try to get a chronology um, of uh, each of these different um, materials and, and textiles. Um, I didn't have too much to say about where things were going to be hung. That was Bob's job. He has much better eye for layout and color. And so I left that to him. One of the first things that hit me on going through this is, why didn't I spend more time with her on the 20 years she was doing that, going in the studio, bugging her on asking questions on how do you do this? Why do you do this? Where do the ideas come from? You know, what are all the technical aspects of this? And I thought, it's too bad of what I don't know. So let's see what I can learn over <laughs> going through this fine. And everything we found was new stuff. This wasn't old stuff that had been out around. These were creations that came out of the business, somehow just got stored and sealed in time. The most difficult thing is getting started. It's, it's finally getting started, and I don't necessarily do it the most professional way. Uh, we wanted to take the whole large Academy gallery downstairs. I picked a good selection of things, but you know, was there enough there? And then you begin to think how it might work. What do we want to do with this? How do we want to treat it? 
what is the impact that the visitor will see who doesn't know anything about weaving feel when they first come in the major entrance door? Where is their eye going to go? So the Academy main gallery is set up into three major sections. I feel the center section is where your eye is drawn first. You may then look at the original doorway with the arched light as a focal point there. So I said, why don't we get all of our best stuff, lay it on the floor in the central gallery, then look at design, color, size. Let's go in and see if we can come up with something where someone's eye will will gently flow and that they will pick a direction that they will follow themselves because they will center in on something and then they will create the movement. We thought that the major impact was the center point was the borrowed piece, which was the only original commission design of, owned by the Land Trust uh, in New London and then put two of our best matching ones on either side of it. On the opposite wall, we chose the great three-panel weaving that went together, which may be 20, 25 feet long. So we had that gallery set, and it was at least a start, and we all felt good on how it looked, and we felt, all right, at this point, we know the show is gonna work. It's gonna work in the room. Then we went to the left-hand gallery, and worked it the same way with far walls, with major hangings, and then inner walls with samples and things. Uh, Richard Candy wanted to handle setting up all of the design work and cases to explain how she started the work on doing designs and things when she was working with specific potential customers. And he also did the same work in the third gallery uh, working on clothes and things. Well, actually, the most important thing to me is to see the exhibit set up by Nancy's brother because he not only selected and hung each of the uh, panels, but then decorated the room with chairs, with tables, with artifacts that were appropriate to each of those designs. So the whole gallery space, which was three large areas, um, looked like the kind of settings that I had been looking at in all the slides that Nancy had done of her work in real living spaces. So that actually was the most interesting part of seeing the gallery come alive with these fabulous works of textile art. things I discovered early on looking at all the slides and the uh, paper materials that uh, came with uh, Bob's collection was the fascinating process of setting up your loom to achieve the final product. You, know, you walk in a room and you see three large panels of beautiful um, woven materials and you don't give much thought to, well, how does it get to be like that? And one of the things I was hoping to do with the uh, exhibit cases of design materials was just to suggest how much work in initial design, conceptualizing the whole physical space that they might sit into. There are a couple of designs where there's a tall weaving going up a staircase, um, a row of weavings behind bank tellers. Clearly, carefully thought out, um, and given an abstract design that a client had to approve. I found a couple where the signature of the client uh, indicated some changes and how those changes occurred uh, and a new design and a new yarn wrapping and 
try to suggest that for every single different title, and there must be hundreds of different weaving titles, each one had to go through this process. And then as the Hampshire Weavers Guild librarian pointed out to me, how much mathematical work had to be done on paper, in fact, to set up the loom correctly so that you would always get the same design uh, in whatever width you were you're weaving. So it seemed to me that giving some indication of the level of design work required for each of these weavings takes an enormous amount of design energy even before you sit down to actually weave. And she wove every piece of this. When you watched her weave, there would be stretches where the shuttle would be just going back and forth and everything would be flat. And then she would, by hand, weave through larger threads and pieces of yarn and color and design. And of course, all of this was designed ahead of time so that she had patterns to follow. Uh, I think I mentioned earlier that when she did, for instance, the wall hanging, she would uh, do what she called a winding, which would be a scale model of what the thing would look like on the person's wall. And remember, each the width of each piece is 60 inches because that's as wide as the warp is. So if somebody wanted something that was 15 feet long, it would have to be three pieces, triptychs, she called them. And so she would give them a thing like about this big that would be the size of the wall sort of scaled, and there would be yarn wound around in the appropriate color so they'd have a sense of what it was going to look like on the, on the wall. So she had all of that as part of this design, and then, then she would follow it when she put together the, the designs. According to sources in the Weavers Guild, uh, and I know nothing about the technique of this, crackle weave is a traditional block weave pattern done in one color and has been around for a long time. And Nancy's inspiration was reinventing it with both texture and color. And uh, she was very well known for crackle weave. She taught workshops on it all over the country um, and uh, was alleged to be, according to those folks, uh, you know, a, a great authority on crackle weave, world's leading authority, as someone said to me. When we did the show at Kobe Sawyer, there was a consultant who was there at the college doing some other work uh, for the art department and came into the space and looked at it for a long time and then finally said, that can't be crackle weave or something. This is reported to me. Um, and so 20 years later, people are still surprised who are knowledgeable about weaving that a traditional weave like crackle can be used in quite the colorful and textured way that, that Nancy did. I was fascinated with the group most recently from the New Hampshire Weavers Guild who came down and a number of them were really interested in, well, how was that woven? So and not very good curatorial practice, I allowed them to turn the weavings over so they could see exactly how something was handled on the backside, and they just loved it. Most of the visitors I've seen have been fascinated that you can actually paint landscapes in fabric. Uh, textile um, arts are terrific for giving an impression of um, any number of these titles that she gave them. Um, and they're just simply so beautiful. So actually a number of people had not realized that Nancy had died and came to me a couple of times asking, um, is there a price list? So I think it's important that the collection uh, be maintained as a single unity rather than continue to be just broken up. Um, because it's a, it's a major figure in the craft community, uh, a wonderful designer that had a lot to say about her native state.
I think Nancy's great contribution was um, both technical. She reinvented the way of weaving something called crackle, uh, but also um, brought her native talents as a designer to creating large-scale um, works that began in the early years <clears throat> with a sort of um, Japanese-style landscape, but very quickly evolved from a generic Japanese-influenced uh, design to something that was more um, related to where she was that it was the woods and the fields and the marshes and the sky of New Hampshire, both in color uh, but also in pattern. And this combination of, of technical skills, um, excellent color sense, and the ability to use weaving as a technique to create these large-scale New Hampshire images, it seems to me, is um, the central point of the larger weavings. Uh, what's, I think, possibly forgotten and we couldn't do enough of in the exhibit is the impact that her clothing had. Um, when we first opened the show, had an opening reception, uh, quite a number of women came wearing their jackets, their coats, their hats uh, that they still had that they had purchased from Nancy years and years and years ago. And even the uh, members of the New Hampshire Weavers Guild were talking about how many different um, jackets and other uh, costume pieces they each remembered, and most of them still had in their closet somewhere. One comment that's come up with many people who have visited, be they weaving people or just people who have known her over the years, said that they just feel that they somehow didn't organize their own lives enough to even attempt to accomplish the things that Nancy did or was interested in. Well, I think, there, I think her, her discipline and probably all aspects of her life that I knew about is the very central reason that she accomplished the things she did. It was really interesting to see all the work hung in, in, in one place, and you could sort of see the various stages of the career. And frankly, I was just blown away with it. It was so attractive, and it was laid out so, so well. And so you really got a wonderful sense of not just what the work was, but how it came into being.
I do think it's interesting um, to take a look at a period of time that 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 was 20 years ago, and and then move it all in in 20 years forward and get a sense for how it still inspires people and is still interesting to people.